Good morning, everybody. <laughs> This isolation thing is uh, gives you time to think. And I've been thinking about my mother. Um, it was Mother's Day here in the UK uh, last weekend. So my mother, God rest her soul, been gone now over 20 years. But um, uh, I was thinking about her and uh, but growing up in North Manchester in the 50s. And uh, my mother had uh, a particularly uh, strange trait. I'm an only child, you may not have guessed, but a lot of us were of that, that period. A lot of my, most of my friends were only children. Um, but anyway, my mother had this quirk where on every photograph, I don't have that many, but I've got a few and I've printed a few off, but um, whenever there's a photograph of me, be it school, gig, you know, blah, 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 she'd put a, a blue cross, a biro cross on me somewhere, on my face, whatever. Just so that people, I guess, going through her head, this would be so people would know it was me. I mean, it's a ridiculous uh, notion, but... For example, here's a very early photograph of me and my mother outside my auntie's house in, in, uh, in Yorkshire. And I don't really can see, just here is, a, is the Blue Cross. And then moving on, uh, this this is a Manchester, you know, North Manchester fun fair in the fifties. Must have been great. I was a bit too young, but I think this is a photograph from the local paper, and uh, you've probably seen this on Facebook. I don't even see that. There's me on the right hand side. Let's look at this. Look at this guy, Colin Blythe. This is a great photograph. But yeah, there's the Blue Cross. Moving on. Now this is my very first gig ever my very first gig with my band i think we had four numbers we could play shadow songs and i said i don't know i don't know. we've got beetle jackets on so it's of that era uh, i'm still in touch with a couple of the guys here there's me in the middle with my uh broadway one pickup guitar we've got sweet we've got like uh thick cord beetle jackets on there's my amp on a little on legs that my dad put on there but yeah, there's the blue cross. There's the blue cross on my white shirt. So there, my mum did that. Yeah, got a bit older, had a band. This is, this photograph is a band uh, I was in. This is great. Look at the composition on this photo. This is outside the old Manchester City football ground, Main Road. Look at the kids here. But you see this mark here above my head? That's a blue arrow or blue cross. It's a bit smudged i think my mum probably smudged it but it's a bit bizarre isn't it there you go but the weird thing is that um i've got i've seen there were school photographs me and you know my grammar school my junior school and there's me blue cross i came across a photograph just me and my grammar school solo photographs one day we had solo pictures taken and yes there's a fucking blue cross on my forehead there's only me in a fucking picture. I mean, you know, that shit can mark you for life. I tell you that. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow. Hi, blog number two. I'm trying to keep these uh, kind of fun and light high, but um, it's been another beautiful day here. Yeah? Isolation day. Um, we went out early, took the dog for a walk on the beach, right the way around about. It's beautiful, not a soul in sight. And then I and then I took Louise up the Durlocks. That was a bit tricky because it's a very steep hill. Anyway, here we are. Um, what should I talk about? Yeah, the Who. I've got many stories of my time with The Who, but um, a lot of which I probably shouldn't uh, share with you. Or maybe I will. Who knows? Um, John Entwistle, The Ox. We got on like a house on fire, John and I, and uh, 
Um, oh, so many stories I could tell you. But anyway, I'll tell you this one. So we're on stage four hours every night, giving it large. Bill Kirby said, the Who's manager, lovable rogue in the wings. Go on, boats, smash it, smash it. I'm giving it large, you know. Not wanting to be a rock god, but I probably thought I was anyway. But anyway, um, and the Ox is there, you know, the world's loudest bass player, but the most softly spoken man. So when you were at, like, in Club Ox afterwards, John would come up and go, Bolts, he'd go, um, what is it about that, sir? And I'd go, pardon? He'd go, did you press that? I'd go, sorry? He'd go, did you have that? I'd go, yeah. He'd go, did you? I said, no, I'd done what he said in the first place. Anyway, so... There we are, giving it large. One night, deep South America, 90,000 people in there. Big star screen screens either side there. So the audience, no matter where they are, little ants up there, I could see everything going on. I'm giving it extra large, you know, we're really going for it. I've got a big red quiff and stuff, you know, but as the lights came on, because it was, it was high August and hot, every insect in the world flying everything, flying stuff is flying around, so we're playing away, and the whole way through this four hour set, four hours, the ox is there, looking at me, like that, and I'm going, yeah, what, you know, kind of like, so every time I look at him, he's looking at me going, so this went on, I thought, what's up with him, you know, like, so carry on, after four hours, we come off stage, and as we're walking back to the dressing room, I come up to the ox and I say, what was up with you? What was all that? He said, did you not see it? I said, see what? He said, the first number, the biggest moth, pink moth, big pink moth like that, must have been like nine inches across, landed on your quiff. I had that much hairspray in there. It landed on your quiff and stuck there for the rest of the show. I was actually mortified. I was gutted because I was the only person in that arena, the only person in that arena of 90,000 people that didn't know I had a big bow on the front of my head and I'm giving it large. I was absolutely, that was it, I was gutted. Anyway, take care and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Isolation vlog number three. Um, Eagle Man. I won't bang on the table either. Eagle Man. I, in the past, I've done a few TV adverts and, uh, you know, commercials, that sort of thing. Just a few. Because someone said I should do about 15 years ago. Someone said, you should get on those TV adverts there. You know what I mean? You've got that kind of face. I said, I don't know about that. They're looking for people that will sell products, not scare them off the product. Anyway, so the first one I ever did was for, um, was for um, Ikea. And all I had to do was put in a pair of goofy teeth, a pair of horn rim glasses, and hold a plate of jammy dodges up to the screen. I didn't even say anything, and I got two and a half thousand pounds. I thought, this is the career for me. Bugger music. You know, this is what I, Anyway, but after that, it's... Uh, they sort of tighten the loopholes about people, you know, getting repeat fees, that sort of thing. So anyway, but I occasionally do a few. I did do, especially when I lived in London. But um, it goes like this. So one day, my agent phoned up, Steve, uh, Ballantine Whiskey, looking for Eagle Man. Oh, yeah? What's that? He said, Eagle Man. They're looking for someone, you know, Ballantine Whiskey, looking for someone with a bit of a beak you know, that they can morph on a computer, like, with feathers on, and make into Eagle Man. Uh, it's two grand. I said, yeah, of course. I said, do it. 
So when you when you go for a casting or an audition, if you like a casting, uh, the situation is you go to a casting uh, suite, studio, and that. So anyway, I said to her, "Do I have is there a dress code? Because sometimes there is." She said, "No, just go as yourself. It's only head and shoulders. They morph you on the computer, put feathers on." I thought I quite like the sound of this. So I got the tube to Oxford Circus. There's a, there's a casting casting studio there. So I went up there, and as I say, it goes like this. You go in, you check in, you have to fill in the form, you know, then you sit in a waiting area with a few other freaks and you kind of look around. And this particular day I'm looking around, I'm looking at the, uh, you know, the people with beaks and stuff. And I thought, is this what my life's come to? Anyway, so what happens normally, you get called in and then you go into another room, you know, a smallish room. And in there, usually it's like a, there's obviously a camera on a tripod in the middle of the room, cameraman. These people are all non-committal and a casting director has got absolutely nothing to do with the finished products. He's just there to sort of sort out potential people, you know, that would be good for the advert. And maybe someone from the from the uh, from the ad company or the production company, whatever. <coughs> Excuse me, so this one particular day, Ballantine Whiskey, Eagle Man. Steve, can you come in please? So I go in the room, and to my surprise, the room's quite full. It's not a very big room. It's camera in the middle, but there's an arc of, uh, of bar stools around, and these attractive women with uh, power dress, you know, with, um, with clipboards and everything, and other people in there. I'm like, whoa, okay, right, fine. So, and then the, this very camp Christopher Biggins type uh, casting director comes in, because Steve, I said, yeah. He said, okay, love, um, strip down to your boxes, and what turns his back, I said, excuse me, mate, um, Eagle Man, Banner, Eagle Man. He went, yeah, that's all very well. Love, just strip down to your boxes. So me like a dope, I actually do what he says. So all of a sudden, I'm just in this room with a strip down to my boxes and a pair of socks. You know, that's what it is. And uh, I said to my, I said, listen, Eagle Man. He said, yeah, that's all right. I said, listen, um, good job for you. I'm actually wearing boxes today because normally I would be a commando. He said, whatever. He said, so he said, Steve, what I want. I'm thinking... You know, I'm stood there in boxer shorts, that's it. And I'm thinking, I will kill the girl at the agency. Next time I see her, I will kill her. So he says to me, he said, so we're in the square room, he says to me, he said, Steve, I want you to imagine, from the head down to the waist, you're a human being. I went, right, okay, okay, cool. I said, but Eagle Mace, he said, it doesn't matter. I said, right, wait. He said, and from the waist down, you're a horse. From the head to the waist, you're a human down. I said, what, you mean like a centaur? He said, centaur, that's very good, love, very good. He said, I want you to imagine you're in a forest. Just imagine you're in a forest. So go over there in the corner of the room, and I want you to walk across the room. I want you to imagine like you, you, um, you come into a leafy glade. So he said, he said, so as you get in the middle of the room, and I'm there, black socks, boxer shorts, that's it. Attractive women, all with clipboards looking at me. He said, as you get here, level with the camera, I want you to just be startled. Like you've been startled, you know, like a, like, oh, you've been startled. So, what must have happened? He said, okay, camera and action. So I, I walk across the room, I must, I must have gone like this. And I got, he said, cut. He comes up to me, he says, Steve, he says, you're too confrontational. I said, listen, mate, of course I'm confrontational. I'm stood here in my dirty boxer shorts. I've got a horse's cock hanging on the floor. I'm supposed to be eagle, man. Of course I'm confrontational. I didn't get that job. But there you go. Um, I thought I'd share that with you. Stay safe and I love you. Bye. Hi everybody, this is Isolation Vlog number four. Um, you know, talking about uh, serendipity and coincidence and how things turn out in your life. And uh, Here's a funny story. 
There's a photograph, another photograph of one of my early bands, The Puzzle. In a sort of like small faces type era, there's me on the, uh, on the left hand side, with the blue cross on me of course. Uh, Brian Cochran on vocals, oh, I was so jealous, he was a good friend of mine, but I was so jealous, he got all the girls. But anyway, so the reason this photo is so rare is the fact that you see here, this guy here on a Vox Continental organ, you know the Vox organ. Uh, we thought if you wanted to be like the small faces or that sort of thing in a mod era, we needed a Vox Continental organ, which we didn't have. So we put an advert in the Manchester Evening News, top mod band require Vox Continental organ player. And we got one advert, one answer, one guy answered. This guy, Kevin. Now, he was in the band for at the best 10 days. We had a couple of rehearsals with him, then we did this gig, and that was it. And I really can't remember how we got rid of him, but he wasn't one of us. He was like a, like a bank clerk or something, and, uh, but really sort of like forward. And when he joined it, he said, I'll join your group as long as I can sing Brooke Benson. Just give me some kind of sign, girl. And we all were like, yeah, that's really not cool. We don't want to do that. But he had the Vox organ, so we let him in. Spooling forward uh, 25 years at least, 25 years. Um, I'm touring America, I think, with The Who or Paul Young, can't remember. I'm checking into a hotel in San Francisco. 25, this is 25 years later at least. I'm checking in a hotel in San Francisco. And this guy came up to me and said, Steve, you may remember me. My name's Kevin. I had a Vox Continental organ and I joined your group. I said, oh, hi, Kevin, how's it going? Well, that's, that's a surprise, isn't it? You know what I mean? But I was a bit embarrassed because I think we just looked the other way and got rid of him. I can't remember how we got rid of him. Anyway, anyway so we made a bit of small talk. I said, small world, didn't it? Two weeks later, two weeks later, I'm in New York City and I'm crossing the road, the one with all the music shops on, and I pulled something out of my pocket and dropped my money on the floor. So I bent down in the gutter to pick up my money and a pair of feet appeared and legs and I looked up and it was him again, Kevin. So we meet again. I thought, this is weird, isn't it? I haven't seen the guy for 25 years in Manchester. 25 years later, I meet him in San Francisco. And then two weeks after that, I meet him in New York, two and a half thousand miles apart. It's a small world, isn't it? Have a good day, guys, and stay safe. Bye. Hi, everybody. This is Isolation Vlog number five. Um, hope everyone's well. Um, <laughs> This is an acoustic guitar. Uh, I put it through a, a pedal like this. It's called a wah wah pedal. I don't know why they call it that. I could have called it anything. But anyway, uh, I was doing a gig. You know, when I do solo gigs, I, I see a lot, a lot of strange stuff and strange people ha come and say weird stuff to me. But anyway, I was playing the old Neptune in Whitstable uh, last summer. It was particularly busy and very sloppy, and I'm playing away, you know, I'm playing away, and this guy came in, tall guy with a trench coat on and uh, straggly hair. I think he'd been smoking jazz woodbines. But anyway, so he, uh, so he came in, he had a little dog with him. The dog was like a ginger fella, bug eyes and a bushy tail. And the guy stood at the bar looking at me, I'm playing away, you know, and I'm watching all this stuff. And the dog's running around the pub, you know, it's just, mad it's crazy you know it's running between the tables and yapping and stuff and so i'm playing away and i'm just watching stuff watching people watching the dog and i noticed that um i did notice that the dog as crazy as it was whenever i uh engage the wah wah which i do regularly you know like occasionally and quite randomly <laughs> just hit it on and off, you know, interge little interjections in songs. And I noticed that whenever I did this, the dog would kind of have a mini seizure and do a little backflip, you know, and I got
go a bit weird. So I tested it out over a few songs, you know, before I said anything. And I'm playing away, you know. And yet, sure enough, every time I hit the wah wah pedal, the dog had a mini seizure. So the guy, eventually I stopped the song, and the guy stood at the bar, the dog's on the floor between his legs, they're all looking at me. I said, You're alright, mate, how's it going? He said, yeah, I thought he's punchy, he's probably skunk. But anyway, so I said, um, I said, is that your dog? I knew it was his dog. I was just trying to open up the conversation. He said, yeah, mate, what, what of it? I said, what kind of dog is that? Like, um, is it like a Pomeranian or something? He said, no, mate, it's a Chihuahua. So when the laughter in my head died down, I said, it's a Chihuahua. He said, yeah, you have a problem with that? I said, no, I don't have a problem with that. I said, but... Your dog, no offence like, is crazy. And it's running around, it's crazy. It's bonkers. But every time I play my wawa, your chihuahua goes extra specially crazy. It throws a thromby, you know. And I've tested it out, I'm not stupid. I've tested it over a few songs, and yet, every time I hit the wawa, your chihuahua goes crazy. He said, yeah, and your point is? I said, I'm not trying to make a point, I'm just saying that, um, you've seen The Simpsons. It's a dog, he doesn't know it's called a chihuahua. It doesn't know it's a chihuahua. It, it just like, you know. I said, but every time I played a wawa, you know, that's what I've just said that. He said, yeah. He said, you're nuts, mate. I said, yeah, well, that's, that's as maybe, but watch out. Anyway, I feel I should play a song. And I will incorporate the wawa.
put some oil on that wah wah pedal. Take care, have a great day. Hi everybody, Wamana Borneo here. Isolation vlog number six. Uh, I'm going ahead with this one, um, despite uh, being strongly advised against it from by my legal team. Um, anyway, I transcribed this transcribed this story a while back. Uh, this concerns uh, atomic rooster back in the day. Got a few drug references in it. Well, it's, it's all about drugs as it happens. And um, the Church of Mormon, Donny Osman, and I'll play a tune at the end anyway, so here we go. Houston Airport, 1971, gig done and looking forward to a few days R&R, &R, the rest and recuperation type. Mad Vincent Crane, skinny as a rake, bandy-legged, half-man, half-mast hipsters, big buckle belt and big girl's blouse. Lank greasy hair falling down to his chest with a face fresh from Banstead Mental Hospital. Pete French, English rock star with layered hair, perfectly proportioned body, velvet star print trousers, tight short sleeve shirt, medallion and man bag way ahead of its time. And last but not least, the freaky two-headed drug consuming monster, not quite joined at the hip, but not able to separate either, Rick Parnell and yours truly, Steve Bolton. White Afghan coat singed with dirt trailing on the floor. We watched the fat-arsed American freaks who in turn stared at us thinking the same. Henry Israel, our personal shepherd for this tour, was an affable, smiling agency man who immediately realised that Rick and I may need that extra guidance to keep us from falling off the edge. Henry. Okay guys, please, let's go, let's go this way to the plane guy. Rick, leave it, you don't need to do that, come on, let's go. He went on to be a great dad. Rick to me, oh man, so looking forward to these few days off in LA. Why don't we start now? I've took at least two hits of window pane acid. Me, okay, cool, Rick. Why don't we just wait till we get on the plane? 30 minutes later, well on the way to being eight miles high, me. Wow, look at this, look at this. I clambered over a Stetson hatted accountant into the buxom lap of his attractive American wife to gain inanely at her and ask if she had ever seen such amazing clouds. Hey, Rick, come and look at this. Rick, wow, far out, man. She's lovely. No, not that. This. Pointing out the window at the Dago sunset, lakes and mountains. I could sense that the plane was coming down, but we certainly weren't. It was at this moment that Henry decided to intervene. Guys, guys, can you please go back to your seats? We're nearly at Salt Lake City. Uh-huh. You what? Salt Lake City? Eh? Uh, eh? Uh, you remember? We're doing a gig for the Mormons here. Uh, uh, how? What? Uh, we can't. We, we don't. We don't have our equipment. It's okay, guys. They promise us there'll be equipment there for us to use. The most, the most perfect air hostess glided up to us. Perfect hair, teeth, face, body. Are you gentlemen okay? You gentlemen are not okay, are you? I was feeling very okay as the plane landed on the tarmac with a thump, gazing down the thousands of steps to get off the plane. The two-headed monster was suddenly experiencing some difficulty. Vincent had turned into that old hawk stroke crow stroke vulture type creature that he always reverted to when I was tripping. Bolton, what are you doing? He knew exactly what the two-headed monster was doing, but there was no stopping it now. At the bottom of the steps, crook up man with teeth. Hundreds and hundreds of teeth like bright white tombstones grinning at us. Henry heard us into a limo, and we floated to our destination. The limo seemed to stop suddenly, and we were hurled by the teeth into the middle of a two-ring circus, complete with red and white big top. The animals and clowns had arrived for the freak show. The equipment was ready and waiting for us, and Vincent cawed over to some hybrid Bon Tempe organ, poking it disgustingly with his claws. Preet French, rock god, ready, went straight to the mic stand, ready to rock. Rick slumped behind Rick slumped trying to make sense of why he's suddenly sitting behind Johnny Osman's My First Drum Kit, gazing stupidly at the sticks, wondering, what the fuck are these? I was on my knees, a dribbling wreck, and strobing like fuck, 
examining the sawdust in infinite detail while catching my nose in the strings of what I was soon to find out was an unplayable guitar. It was at this point in the proceedings Rick and I looked at each other and heard the words that we didn't want to hear. Vincent counting the first song in, a one, two, three, and we realised that after four, we'd, we'd have to do something. Rick shouted over to me, check this out, and threw one stick straight into the apex of the big top in complete and fabulous slow motion. We gawked as it twirled and spun in the air. It was beautiful. That's nothing, watch this. My guitar was suddenly on, on an elastic strap and I threw it high into the air as Rick and I watched it dance and spin slowly to its descent. Things now got incredibly hazy. I was leaping and diving, spinning around. I was a psychedelic trapeze artist, shining in the spotlight created by row upon row of Mormon teeth grinning down on us. Rick and I were having the time of our lives when suddenly, bang, we were led out of the ring being chastised like naughty chimps and pushed back into the limo. No teeth were on display now and we had clearly done something very wrong. But what? The two-headed monster looked at itself and said, I think that went rather well, don't you? He agreed. Years later, I did some work with Donny Osmond. And at one point, Donny said to me, he said, hey, Boltz, he said, uh, he said, did you ever work with a band called Atomic Rooster? I said, yeah. He said, ah, oh, OK, yeah, I've heard stories. Just say no, kids. <laughs> Summer day, she went away. She's gone and left me. She's gone to stay, but now she's gone. I can't worry. All the fall, even to Christmas, and my overalls. But now she's gone. I can't worry.